Hello, this is Stephen Dominguez, BS, in the BS Podcast Network. Please enjoy this fine, fine podcast. Admiring your handiwork? Touring the riot scene. Gravely assessing the devastation. Upstanding mayor stuff. You're not the mayor. Things change. What do you want? Ah, the direct approach. I admire that in a man with a mask. <laughs> you don't really think you'll win, do you? Things change. Meow. Who are you? I'm Batman. Who are you? My name is Bond. 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 Batman. His name is Bond. James Bond. I'm Batman. Bond. James, James Bond. Bond. I'm Batman. Bond. 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 I'm Batman. This is the Batman vs. James Bond Show. The show covering everything related to Batman and James Bond movies. And now, here's your host, Brian Thomas. Hello everyone and welcome back to an all new episode of the Batman vs. James Bond Show. The name's Thomas, Brian Thomas, and I am your host. And this is the show where we discuss everything related to Batman and James Bond movies. It's great to be back. Oh yeah. Uh, I hope everybody had a fantastic week. Mine was excellent. It uh, was a very crazy week because, it, if I haven't said this, this is the time of the year where Comic Cons are in full swing. Now, last year at this time, I was talking more about Comic Cons on the show, and I'm not going to really mention it aside from the fact that I did dress up as one of my favorite characters. No, not the one that I usually do. I did not dress up as Batman. I actually dressed up as James Bond. Which James Bond, you ask? Well, Whichever one wore the white tux, and you could say Roger Moore, Sean Connery, no, Pierce never did, um, Daniel Craig, so, you know, and, you know, what was surprising is that a lot of people did recognize me as James Bond. I didn't even have to do anything. I carried around the martini glass, and even when I didn't, I was carrying my fake Walther, and people were like, it's James Bond, and then you guess you strike the James Bond pose, and it worked out pretty well, and then there was a few people that are like, are you Sterling Archer? I'm like, Sure, that works. Okay, why not? Sure. And then I'm like, danger zone. So, you know, um, you know, overall though, great week, but um there is a lot of things to get to, and there is a certain person that is making his big return to Batman versus Bond. That's right, the host of that so nineties podcast, Bobby Semelsberger. Welcome back to the show. Great to talk to you again, sir. Thank you, Brian. I'm happy to be back. And man, am I pumped to talk everything Batman, everything Bond. I'm getting a little sweaty just thinking about it. Well, uh, it's great to have you, and I have to say that I'm referring to you online as the 90s expert. You are my 90s expert go-to, okay? I just want to make that clear, all right? And, a lot of pressure, and, all right? But well, I can do it. <laughs> and when I heard this review, when I saw this review, it was coming up on my counter. I'm like, who better than the man who I talked to about Batman Forever and Batman and Robin, the two worst of the Batman films? Let's redeem ourselves with a better Batman film. Or maybe what what could be classified as maybe one of the best. That we'll talk about that. Well, you might Hopefully be the, the deciding most factor. Interesting. In it. Yes, definitely. So, yeah. um, Bobby will be sitting in with me for the whole show, and we'll, we have a lot to talk about. Like I said, but before we jump into things, just a reminder: Batman versus Bond dot com. That's right. You know the name. It doesn't have a number, but go there for all the latest shows and more content. And you can also find the show on the BS Podcast Network. That's BS Podcast Network dot com. Find my show and a whole bunch of our other great shows on there. Now. Um, I'm going to skip news. I'm going to do this kind of out of order here. I'm going to do this kind of like a memento in a way. Um, you know, I'm going to just say that th let's talk about Batman Returns. Let me just give you it, it's the 25th anniversary of Batman Returns released on uh, June 19th, 1992. I would say I was in maybe first or second grade, give or take when this movie came out. Um, I know a lot of listening audience is right around that same age. Bobby, give or take, were you in like elementary school or 
preschool? Well, I'm or? definitely going to date myself. Oh, God. I was not I, born I yet. Young... <laughs> I was not born yet. You little... Mm, never mind. Um, th- that's okay. <laughs> but you remember probably when the first time you watched this, I, I would imagine. Oh, anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. And I, I know I didn't see this in theaters. And, you know, if my parents took me to theaters, I can only imagine what the other parents were thinking about that. The other co- kids were probably like, hey, he's one of the cool kids. But no, I had to wait till... Back in the day, kids, as we always say, there was something called VHS. And when the VHS came out at Blockbuster or you were able to buy it at your local Walmart or wherever, then you know you were the talk of the town. So um, what I'd like to do is give a quick synopsis, and then we're going to go right into it. So the synopsis for Batman Returns um, – Batman Returns, that's right. Sorry, there's so many Batman movies this week. I apologize. Directed by Tim Burton, uh, the monstrous penguin st- with Danny DeVito, who lives in the sewers beneath Gotham, joins up with wicked, shock-headed businessman Max Shrek Christopher Walken to topple the Batman Michael Keaton once and for all. But when Shrek's timid assistant, Selina Kyle, Michelle Pfeiffer, finds out that Shrek tries to kill her, she is transformed into the sexy Catwoman. She teams up with the penguin and Shrek to destroy Batman, but Sparks fly unexpectedly unexpectedly excuse me when she confronts the cape crusader starring michael keaton as batman bruce wayne danny devito as the penguin oswald cobblepot michelle pfeiffer as catwoman selena kyle christopher walken as max shrek and michael golf as alfred pennyworth um let me hold off on the fun facts right now let's let me know what you think about batman returns what's the first thing you think of when you think of batman returns uh, first thing I think of is black ooze coming out of Danny DeVito's crepid mouth. Oh, I'm so glad That's you mentioned that. Thing. I have a fun fact for that. Okay. Uh, do you want to go into the fun fact or should I just... No, I go, just you go, right go ahead. I'll, I'll come back to it. It's okay. It's okay. Right. Um, because, so my first memories of Batman Returns is that, and we talked about this last time I was on, is that I was a huge fan of Batman Forever, mm-hmm. uh, Batman and Robin, definitely the Schumacher stuff because growing up, of course, you know, I'm younger. So I grew up yeah. with these movies. You know, I, on VHS, I'd watch Batman Forever over and over, Batman and Robin. I didn't even think I knew that the Tim Burton movies existed until I was like oh, maybe, man. you know, seven, eight or nine. Yeah. Because those movies were frightening. So there's probably a reason my parents were trying to keep those away from me. Right. Because they are now we kind of look back and we're like, oh, those Tim Burton movies are cheesy because they are yeah. like, especially 1989 is pretty cheesy. It's compared to like The Dark Knight. Oh, yeah. But at the time and even, you know, in the in the late 90s, early 2000s. Those movies were still pretty dark, right? Oh, yeah. Pre-Batman Begins, it was like, that's the darkest thing you've seen Batman do, that whole world. Um, very steamy, you know. Um, but so Batman Returns, though, like I said, the first thing that freaked the crap out of me as a kid was Danny DeVito. <laughs> and they go over the top trying to make him the most frightening looking thing you've ever seen, especially for a kid <laughs> like me, because I don't like horror movies. Right. You know, I'm afraid I'm afraid of like just the the. The lightest of will to horror movies. So something like Danny DeVito, I still, I'm not even, I'm not even ashamed to say still sometimes when it's completely dark in this apartment and I'm about to go to sleep, if that image of Danny DeVito like <laughs> gnawing down on a fish or like breaking or eating that dude's nose where the blood oh, squirts out, yeah. those images are scary. Like mm-hmm. those are creepy and he's such a disgusting creature. And I know that adds to, that adds to exactly what Tim Burton was trying to do. Yeah. And Danny DeVito obviously is great in that role. I'm just saying like this movie for certain kids like me growing up is uh, haunting. Mm-hmm. It is haunting. So anyway, that's my initial memories of Batman Returns. Obviously, I've watched it many times since then. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's the hideous Penguin Man. And I, oh. I, I never was able to figure out, even last night when I watched it, I was like, is he really eating a fish? Because Danny DeVito stayed in character, they said, throughout the whole time. So I'm thinking... Maybe he would. It's Danny DeVito, the guy. I mean, he's great at what he does, and put he put himself into this role. But that's yeah. And the no, uh, it could be worse. My nose could be gushing blood. It's like oh, and that that's not the part that freaks me out. Now every time I think of Catwoman and I think of Batman Returns, I think of when Selena Kyle and we're putting a big spoiler alert because the movie's been out for 25 years. So pause this episode <laughs> if you haven't watched it and then come back. But when she when Max Shrek pushes her out of the window out of the building and she falls that's not the problem it's when the cats are chewing on her fingers it it, mm. it and her eyes that sh- that michelle pfeiffer is actually able to make roll and that that's not cgi this is before yeah well, i mean they were just starting with cgi but 
she was able to do that, and it, I can't watch that. It freaks me out to this day. It really does. That scene freaks you out. So it's Catwoman that freaks you out. Um, that part really does. Yes, the yeah. the black oozing out does not freak me out. I I think it's it, it's just more humor. I think I'm looking beyond that because I just think that his look in there. Just, just as he's trying to pull the umbrella, I think it's priceless. I really do. Um, you know, the the very beginning of this movie, how it starts off. First of all, you have somebody that I know you're familiar with, and I forget the name of the actor who played Pee Wee Herman. Come on, what's the guy's name? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, put me on the spot. Yeah, I, I just did. <laughs> I was going to say Paul Reiser. I know it's not Paul oh, Reiser. No, it's, it's Paul something, right? Yeah, yeah. But you know so. you know who I'm talking about. Anyway, so, and I never watched Pee Wee Herman growing up, but now that I know who Pee Wee Herman is, I'm like, oh, it's Pee Wee Herman. He's the father of the penguin. And that's how I always recognize him as. But you have that, and then it's just a very creepy intro. You know, everything from the birth of the penguin, how he takes the cat and he just pulls it in there and does whatever he does to it i was i'd assume that he's eating the cat i i would assume Mm -hmm. and then even his parents are very dark because they they have this child that is obviously abnormal they throw it's christmas time at that time and they throw into the sewer it's like wow okay we're we're gonna skip just a regular you know pre-title sequence or just just the intro of you know the title sequence and we're going right to something than that Okay, this is a Burton Batman. This is a Burton film, not just a Burton Batman film. I mean, this is the guy who did Edward Scissorhands, which I still find kind of creepy at this, and you know, still to this day. Uh, mm-hmm. Beetlejuice was it, it's you have it's an acquired taste. I like Beetlejuice. I, I think it's maybe because I like Michael Keaton. I like the dark humor in there. Um, yeah. You know, but it, just going into that, it's just. It, it you're you're in for a different ride. It feels like, and just the vision of Gotham City. You know, you can tell it's a different type of set. It's not so much as kind of closed in. It looks a little bit more spread out. If that makes any sense, it's a little brighter yeah. to to as bright as a Tim Burton Batman movie can be. Anyway, slightly yeah. slightly <laughs> brighter gray than yeah. the brightness of the first one. Right. Um. You know, we obviously don't have the Joker or uh, Carl Grissom or Jack Palance returning because uh, we know what happened to them in the previous film. But what's so interesting about this is that it's not a sequel per se. I mean, I've always thought of this as a sequel, but like uh, I said, um, Burton did not want this to be a sequel. He wanted this to be his own thing. Um, you know, the writer of this, Sam Ham, he actually wrote something called Batman 2. And what his intentions were with that is that it would be more along the lines of Batman 89, whereas the Penguin would be more of a gangster. He'd be running around with like a AK-47 or Tommy gun, what have you. And Selena Kyle wouldn't be quite exactly how we pictured her in there. Um, you know, it's some really interesting things to this. And of course, Burton said, I want full control of this film. And after watching this, and if you've watched enough Burton Batman or Burton films, you know exactly what he's capable of, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as overall though, I think I I always like revisiting this. It's now becoming more of a Christmas movie for me. So watching this at this time of the year, I'm like, Oh, Christmas in June. Okay. It works. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, you know, other thoughts about Batman returns. What do you think? Well, so for me, I think I really wish I was one of the people that was like, ah, Batman Returns is the greatest superhero movie or one of the best superhero movies or whatever, Mm -hmm. because there are a lot of people out there. I saw a lot of posts on Twitter because it is the 25th anniversary anniversary as we record right now. So on Twitter, I saw a bunch of people saying, oh, it's the best Batman. It's so awesome. You know, definitely stands above whatever. For me, I'm like, I wish I was the cool person that was like, <laughs> oh, Batman, Batman Returns is the best Batman, better than Christopher Nolan or whatever. Yeah. But for me, it's like I appreciate this movie more than I really actually like it. Like, I think the movie is fine. I don't think it's like mm-hmm. great because I yeah. do think it's so weird. But I appreciate it for what Tim Burton basically got away with, mm-hmm. which is like, you know, the first movie, 1989 Batman, Tim Burton basically played it by played it by the books. Right. It was like yeah. he made a pretty awesome blockbuster movie for the time right. that made a bajillion dollars and sold all the lunch boxes and all the action figures. Yeah. It was unprecedented for the time. And then with the sequel, they're probably much just like, Hey, you made us so much money, Tim. If you come back for the sequel, you can do whatever you want, have as much creative freedom. And that was, it's kind of like the long con in a way because right. Tim Burton was like, great. Now I get to make the Batman movie. I really want to make, which is not as really a superhero movie in the way that we know superhero movies. Mm-hmm. Like I think this movie is for being a blockbuster summertime, especially a sequel to one of the most successful movies of all time at that point. Mm-hmm. Like this is like kind of what you're saying, 
a completely different ride, completely out of left field. Like with the expectations, that's why I kind of wish I was the right age when these movies came out because I want to know when people saw this movie so pumped, they were amped after the first one. Yeah. And I feel like there's probably a lot of people that came out of this movie that were kind of, I mean, some of them loved it. Probably some people were like, what did I just watch? Like, what was that? That was not what I was anticipating. And I think this movie has a lot of great sequences to it. And there's a lot of great uh, art, art decoration. And there's, there's so many great things about it. I just think overall, it's not, it's really not my cup of tea. At least the last time I watched it, I haven't watched it in a little bit, but right. maybe if I watch it now, I'd have a little bit more of a, like a appreciation uh, from like an artistic standpoint. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, man, Hey, right on for Tim Burton for just being like, I'm going to do what I want to do. And I'm going to make the penguin, like I'm going to make you care about the villains more than Batman. Mm-hmm. Right. Because Batman feels like a side character in his own movie. This exactly. is very much about yes. Catwoman. Yeah. Very much about penguin. And I mean, now that we have so many Batman movies, it is nice to kind of have all these different flavors. Like you mm-hmm. have the Christopher Nolan, you have the Schumachers, you have whatever Ben Affleck's doing, you have Lego <laughs> Batman, you yeah. know, and then here you have the dark and twisted, dark and twisted in a different way than maybe Heath Ledger's Joker's dark and twisted. Like mm-hmm. this is dark and twisted in a completely strange, over the top, cartoony yet frightening it's like a frightening cartoon it's like a nightmare before christmas like like yeah. tim burton's nightmare before christmas okay um yeah so anyway there's a lot that i like that we can get into yeah but yeah it is it is it is a strange movie it is a strange movie especially for a blockbuster and you gotta appreciate it for that yeah and what's so funny about that and i touched on a few things that you said is that it we would consider it a blockbuster or but when you really watch this movie or you go back and watch this movie, it really isn't. I mean, can, there really uh, isn't like any big building explosions. There's nothing like, um, yeah, I mean, there are car chases in here. There are some action sequences in here. But this is more, as you said, kind of like art house. Could this be considered more of an art house film in a way? Yeah, definitely. And I think actually, you know, what's funny is like I feel like some of the things – like some of the bigger, uh, like at the end, for example, you have uh, uh, Batman crash into the Penguin uh, duck mobile, right? Yes. And then then the, then the Batman gets out, and the Penguin like attacks him. That scene, that scene right there, just feels forced. Like it feels like like that's an action. Oh, that's the action moment. It's when, right. it's when Batman fights the Penguin, and it's mm-hmm. like I just remember always being like, this is really like it doesn't. It feels so out of place. Like yeah. it's just like these characters wouldn't like. Obviously, Penguin can't hold it alone against Batman, but it kind of felt like well. Even Tim Burton was like, we have to have some sort of action thing in there. So let's put this little action thing in there. You right. know, the, the, but, but even all the action moments don't even – aren't even like these crazy, amazing action moments. Like even Batman versus Catwoman, like their quote-unquote fight is more of this weird like hyper-sexualized – It's kind uh, of a waltz or just – yeah, in a way. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, like a, it's like a waltz. And there's cool – there's always cool moments. Like there are – like I like, mm-hmm. like when Penguin makes his uh, umbrella turn into a helicopter and awesome. he flies away and then yeah. – and then when Batman has – some people think this is stupid, but when he has like the Game Boy Batarang that he throws, <laughs> yes. right? It's pretty much – it's, all it's like people. a drone. It really is. It, they were thinking ahead. It's a drone, but even that stuff feels – are like such Tim Burton-esque, like especially 80s, 90s Tim Burton-esque like little features. Like right. I feel like he's – like he was – it feels like Tim Burton was probably having the time of his life. Oh, yeah. You know, he's probably like, oh, what about a Batarang that does this? Mm-hmm. And oh, what about, what about some penguins that got little rocket launchers on their backs? And it's like <laughs> – him why he's like because we have the money to do it like he finally has the money and the power at this point to do whatever he wanted and so mm-hmm. for me i'm just like right on tim burton go crazy yeah but i i feel like even those like even like i'd actually see like if it wasn't meant to be this blockbuster movie i wonder if tim burton would have even gone weirder with it and it would have even had less like yeah. action moments and less even less like maybe even plot or maybe even batman wouldn't even be in the movie like who knows like yeah if he was like Batman Returns, but it stars the Penguin. Mm-hmm. You know, because this, essentially this movie has Danny DeVito maybe in it more than Michael Keaton. Yeah, I, I was going to say, um, essentially we have, it's a Penguin-Catwoman origin story featuring Batman Bruce Wayne. I mean, Michael Keaton is the top build, and they, you know, they, he made sure he held out for more money with this, which rightfully yeah. he should have. Um, Burton came back with this, and he wasn't even sure, but like I said, he wanted to have his way on this, but this is not a blockbuster action film. It's more of a drama thriller, if anything, with some yeah. action scenes in, in it. You do have 
Batman on a hang glider. You have him, you know, fighting some thugs. Um, the opening to this, when we actually see Batman, which is probably not like until 15 minutes in, um, you know, it's, he goes right into, into Gotham City. Um, be one of the, one of the better sequences of the movie, I think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's shooting beanbags at the, the guy, the skull guys on the, uh, dirt bikes. And, um, he lights somebody on fire. And yes, Batman kills. He killed a couple times in this movie. Oh. Yeah. <gasps> That's okay. Um, you know, little things like that. No, I mean, they're great sequences and they're filmed. I mean, for a movie that was filmed in 1992, it's, it holds up really well, you know, considering the cinematography. But it comes down to the story of Batman. I, this is my problem with Batman Returns. It's just like Batman was pushed aside because I guess Burton thought that um, Catwoman and Penguin were more interesting, I think, in a way. Yeah, yeah, he relates with those type of characters. Yeah, and, I mean, he brought out the best in both of them. I mean, you know, if, like you said, if Batman wasn't in there, then, you know, he might have made it a, only a cameo if Burton probably had his way. Not saying mm -hmm. that Burton doesn't like Batman, because everything that Michael Keaton did when he was on screen was perfect. He ripped up, the scenes that were written with him, he ripped up the dialogue, not ripped up, but he said, "Oh, that's great dialogue. I don't want to. I'm not going to say that though. When I'm in the bat suit, I'm less is more. And the, just that new, the updated bat suit in there, which I think is one of the better bat suits. I think it's up there with yeah. the um, Batman Begins and the right now the uh, the Ben Affleck Batman suit, the the one from Batman v Superman. So I'll give it to yeah, that. Yeah, I think it looks better." You look at the, it's funny, the Batman, the Batman 89 one, it didn't yeah. weird how the symbol has the little legs on it. Yeah, well, there, the there, was, that, there was some kind of legal dispute with that where they couldn't use that. So that was so, oh, what was so that great bad? about that, that they could get kind of get more of this kind of symbol going on. That's the symbol on my mm -hmm. T-shirt there. Um, yeah, so they had all that. Um, you know, other things, though, I would say that it was nice to see, you know, Michael Keaton back as Batman. Like I said, everything that he did in there, his facial expressions, you know, you got to do the whole body turn you can't he can't turn his head obviously that's another thing in here um but you know i haven't i i think michael keaton knocked it out of the park i really do um you have he looks great like he yeah. looks great like you were saying like in the bed the bat suit i do think i think that's the best one yeah. I, I think it, it has that like art deco feel to it yeah. and and he he looks amazing. Like him just mm -hmm. standing like when he first comes out of the Batmobile, like the first time we see him full in costume. Yeah. Oh, and he does that thing where he shoots the grappling hook at the at the uh, at the clown that yes. has that has Selena Kyle yeah. misses him and then just rips out the wall behind him. Right. So kick ass. Yes. And then he just kind of stands there with the shadows. Yeah. Michael Keaton, like you say, nailed it. Like nailed it. He nailed it. Yeah. And you know what? There was no reason to come for him to come back for a third one because what no. else was he gonna do? I feel like he kind of like peaked. Now, even he was like, I'm good. You know, yeah. second, I'm done too. I'm out of here. Yeah, yeah. I've done two. I think I'm, I'm good. Yeah, I'll, I'll do mm -hmm. Birdman eventually and then be Spider Man's uh, villain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I would say, yeah, that you could tell the dialogue. There might have been dialogue there, but he's like, you know, F it. I'm not going to do it. There's no dialogue needed. I'm, in, I'm a Batman because I'm Batman. I can do that. I can shoot some. I don't have to like shoot somebody with a grappling hook. I can just throw it in the wall and say, oh, you missed. And then just pull it. Perfect. And, um, you know, how he disappeared. He would just walk away when he's talking to the commissioner and the mayor. And he just disappear there. Um, how he suits up, you know, and the bat signal. Oh, that, that bat signal. When Commissioner Gordon says at the very beginning, when the circus gang goes into Gotham City, uh, when they're of the lighting the tree, he's like, what are you waiting for? The signal. Michael Keaton's just got his hand on his fist on his, and he's just kind of like in the dark. Who knows where uh, Alfred is? He probably dismissed him for the night. Alfred, I'm going to just kind of uh, think about Vicky Vale and what could have been. And mm. all of a sudden the signal turns on in his room and he stands up. That is still one of my favorite scenes of any Batman movie. It truly is. Yeah. Mixed with the Danny Elfman score. Another plus is that we got Danny Elfman back who almost didn't come back for this because he was upset that, um, you know, because there was music such as pr there was a lot more Prince and more hit music that was used in the beginning one. And he wanted it more kind of, you know, more of a music score. And I think he did. It actually ended up being one of the better scores that he did. I'm in between if I like this better than the Batman 89 score. I'm not sure because you have some new themes. You still have the returning Batman theme, which I can listen on repeat over and over again, which I pretty much have all day. Um, mm -hmm. Another good thing about this is Christopher Walken. I think that he is the main villain of this film. And, you know, I think that 
I mean, Christopher Walken, you know, I, I've seen him in other movies before. He's been a Bond villain even, but this is him unplugged. He is, he's a, well, yeah, I said this about Ares with Wonder Woman. Yeah, Christopher Walken's uh, Max Shrek is a dick also, you know? He really is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pure evil. He is pure evil. I mean, he pushes his secretary out of a window and he tricks, you know, a guy who's just trying to reclaim his birth, trying to discover his identity and tricks him and uses him to get power of a mayor so he can be build a power plant. I mean, that's that's twisted. Yeah. And he kills his own partner, too. Um, when they show, oh, the hand. That, there's something creepy. The the hand um, in the sewer when uh, Max Shrek meets the penguin for the first time. That's a dark scene, aside from the little penguins oh. that are running around, if you remember that. Yeah, and he's also, like, stuck in a little bird cage. Yeah. Uh, and everything. Yeah, you know, for me... I, I don't know. I don't really like Christopher Walken in this movie, to tell you the truth, because I feel like he's just it, – it, I don't know. It's like you already have these two villains. Now we have a third villain. Yeah. I think it just adds to the problem that I personally have with the movie, whereas I'm like – and as you start talking about Michael Keaton, all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, he is great in this movie. Like Batman is awesome in Batman Returns. Yeah. But like we were saying, you don't get enough Batman. If that's if that's right. your problem with it. like if you like the villains, then this is your movie. I think personally, I don't really connect with Penguin. And I don't connect with obviously I don't correct with the evil man Christopher Walken. So it's like Batman, I I, I think if Batman was more front and center, mm-hmm. but here we have now we have three villains that are yeah. the forefront. Mm-hmm. Batman is now playing second fiddle to also Christopher Walken. And I think for me at least, Christopher Walken because I believe I read that that was originally supposed to be Harvey Dent. That's correct. Right? Yes, they were supposed to have uh, Billy D. Williams back, but they ended up replacing him with that instead. So and may- maybe because then that they, there could be like obviously there'd be a cliffhanger that lead the Two Face and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Maybe that I would like that more. But for me, I think Christopher Walken was always you know he's you're I guess you're supposed to hate him because like we said he's just pure evil. Yeah. But I always was just like screw this guy. He's not even he's not even as interesting as Penguin or Catwoman. At least they're oh, like super villains. At least they're doing crazy weird right. stuff. He's just a guy in a suit that's just a dick. Like, just a prick you know yeah i think this goes into the overcrowding of villains which i think especially nowadays with superhero films we tend to see it's you know one wasn't enough so let's have two and actually end up having three if the more you look at it and i think that uh, just if they would have stuck with just the penguin and or just if they had their way just Catwoman. I think that that could have been a. They could have gone more with the dark love story about the duality and so forth of these two characters in there. And when Michelle Pfeiffer and Michael Keaton are on screen together, you know whether it's in costume, which I think is the best. Um, all right, fine. I'll say the quote. Um, Missile two can be deadly if you eat it, but but even deadlier. But I don't it, remember the rest. Ah, but a kiss can be deadlier if you mean it. I think, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. He was deadly Close enough. That's okay. It's probably better I said it by myself anyway. You yeah. You put me on the spot today. And I'm you're making sorry, me look like an idiot. No, I would never do that. No, never. Um, I would say that, you know, when you see the scenes of just Selena Kyle and Bruce Wayne, that they're really, they feel out of place, but in a good way. They just, they know that they are just these characters that are in a world where they they don't fit in and they play that off so well they really do and they're trying to play like they're normal but they're not there's so much going on with these characters and that's what burton was able to do with these is the character study we did get that backstory at least of michael keaton's batman and batman 89 and if you didn't see batman 89 then it probably won't make much as much sense of why this guy's do dressing up as a bat it's not that it's necessary though we don't have to understand it's just the fact that this is batman and that he's out there to fight crime and you know that that's how it is um selena kyle's story though of just the uh just the kind of flimsy kind of i actually could say flimsy would be the word i don't know kind of ditzy maybe in a way secretary and just very soft-spoken just kind of goes with it boss pushes her around but um you know when she becomes catwoman her losing her mind in that scene when she comes back after she's kind of you know being bitten by the cats and after falling from the building that's a very dark scene i remember watching that as a little kid i'm like whoa this is a little much maybe for me i don't know she's stuffing you know her to- her toy animals um down the uh tr- the garbage disposal she's you know just destroying pictures all over the place and just you know it's she's bleeding you know when she's sewing up her costume and it's just like this is kind of freaky like you said i think this is the most horror batman movie we've ever had also 
Yeah, you know, I I love Michelle Pfeiffer, like, as Catwoman. I think maybe because that's, like, maybe the first Catwoman I ever experienced. Come yeah. on, that leather suit? That thing is iconic. <laughs> Bondage. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I just, I don't know why, but I, for, I, don't, I can't even name many movies that Michelle Pfeiffer's in, but, like, for some reason I have a crush on Michelle Pfeiffer. I don't know Scarface. why. Maybe it's from this movie. Yes. I mean, I can only name, like, a handful, but, yeah. like, it's weird, but I really like, like, in this, I really like her. And mm-hmm. I really like, like, as we're talking, I'm like, I realize... I love Michael Keaton as Batman. I love Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman. Like everything with those two, which mm-hmm. is like, you know, half of the movie pretty much. Mm-hmm. I love all that stuff. Yeah. I think for me, it's all the penguin as the mayor and the Christopher Walken pulling the strings. Don't care for that as much. Mm-hmm. But those two guys, I don't know why, but I find him, his individual story, her individual story, and then them together mm-hmm. and what they have to deal with and how they relate with each other because they're both, you know, kind of have these dual personalities and they don't know if they can be together and all this stuff. Yeah. I find that really interesting. I, I actually find that, like, I, I don't know why, but I think those characters really resonate with me more. Mm-hmm. Maybe because, obviously, in this movie, Penguin is a mutant. I'm a mutant freak and I hate everyone. You know, I yeah. I just don't connect with that. I just, I, I wish I did, but I don't connect with that. But I think there's something just about Batman and Catwoman and mm-hmm. just that duality that I do. I don't know. Obviously, I don't dress up at night and jump around as Monkey Man or something. But yeah. like, I do, I do, I think just gravitate towards those stories even more. Mm-hmm. And, and like I said, all the scenes I think about with the movie, with them or individually or whatever, I'm just like, oh yeah, that's a great scene. And that's mm-hmm. a great scene. Like, um, you know what I love in this movie? It's another probably little Tim Burton flourish. Sure. I love seeing how Batman gets into that fish tank puts his little hand in yes. and he turns on the light in the little in his little wayne mansion fish uh sized uh wayne mansion yeah which opens up like a sarcophagus yeah and what it goes is that i never i couldn't figure that out i still don't it's like all pointy inside it. and i'm like how yeah. does he not get hurt but okay i think that's the whole point is like yeah. if, for some reason if, if, if the if the cleaning lady accidentally turned on the fish thing and then she was like oh and then you know, she doesn't want to go down the bat cave slide. No. But like I, I don't know, like even that little thing, I've always remembered that like that was awesome. And I've yeah. always loved how to see how does Batman get into the bat cave? And obviously Batman begins, he like plays three notes on the on the piano, and then right. like the little bookcase opens, and then Batman Forever he has a slide from his office or whatever. But yeah. anyway, mm-hmm. like anyway, everything I think about with Batman in this movie or Catwoman, I'm just like, Yeah, that was awesome. Like mm-hmm. even you were saying the hand glider thing. When oh, he stands cool. up on that ledge yeah. and shing shing and he just has these wings. They kind of come out of nowhere and disappear out of nowhere, or he, right. he kind of just drops it. I'm like that's awesome too. Yeah. And uh, and uh, and, and even his his it's not the bat boat, but whatever he's on at the end. No, the it's bat, the bat boat. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is it technically the bat boat? Yeah, it would I, be the bat boat. Yeah. Even that looks super cool. Oh, yeah. So you know, anyway, as you can tell, listening, it's like I prefer my Batman movies with Batman. Right. But um, Me too. yeah, there's so much good things in this movie. Like, there's so much good things for me personally. I just think overall. It's just it's too weird. It's just a little too just out of grasp for me. It's a little bit too like I just don't. It has a lot of stuff I don't like. It has a lot of great stuff in it too. Mm-hmm. But what if you have me think and you and you do that a lot? Last time you I was on your show, I, I was thinking a lot because I changed my opinion about two Batman movies. But I will say that what you can tell that the studio had influence because they wanted the Penguin in this. Whereas Burton and Sam Hamm, the writer, wanted to have Catwoman in this. So it's almost like if you have two movies combined in this. And what if, you know, you had, you know, just the Batman and Catwoman story as the sequel? Maybe that could have been better. Maybe you could have had more action in that. I have no idea. Um, maybe it could have gone in a different direction. Uh, but then again, you have, if you just had Batman with versus the Penguin and Max Shrek, that would have been a good separate story. It, there's a lot crammed into here. It's it's just over two hours, if, not, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm-hmm. And you get a lot. You have, you know, Batman just driving around in the Batmobile, just like he would in the TV show. Um, or I'm talking about like the animated TV series, that is. And that's mm-hmm. what I, I picture that a lot more with Batman Returns than I do with the original Batman 89. Um, you know, I, like you said about like the fish tank thing, instead of a bat pole, like they used to do in the, the Adam West Batman, uh, rest in peace, you know, instead of going down that, he actually, it's more, a little bit more clever than that. I liked his little joke in there when he was, and this is like an inside joke, apparently with the writer and the director about the writer didn't like about how Vicky Vale was let into the bat cave in 1989. So he kind of threw in this line. He's like, oh yeah. So when, um, 
Michael Keaton's talking to Alfred. He's like, oh, yeah, well, who led Vicky Vale in the Batcave? He's like, all right, of a sudden, awesome. I'm, I'm there. And then who's there? Oh, there she is. Hi, Vic. <laughs> you know, I thought that was really funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know, other good things about this, I would say, um, you know, when they did have the action sequences, you know, I did like seeing the Batboat in there. That was really cool. Um, the penguin, The penguins with the missiles on the back. It, it's fun. I don't know. I guess I'm a sucker for the little penguins. I think they're so cute. I really do. <laughs> and and I'm skipping ahead here, but the, it's so it's cute, but it's so sad at the end when they when they carry the penguin, um, when they carry Danny DeVito into the water. That little funeral sequence. It breaks my heart every time I watch that. It really does. And just like it, at the same time, you have Batman searching for Catwoman after he had, she literally fried, you know, Max Shrek, which is probably your favorite part of the whole movie. Um, mm-hmm. He's searching for her, and you want to want him to find her, and then all of a sudden you have the Penguin just sneak up on him. It, it's just some really, really good things in there. Um, I'm trying to think of things I dislike, and the biggest dislike of this, why it does not, it, it's not my favorite Batman movie, is because the main thing. You don't see enough Batman in here. Um, I was doing some research about this, and I'm trying to think, okay, well, really, in how much of Batman screen time do we actually get in this? Now, in Batman 89, the movie was about 126 minutes, and we actually see 28 minutes of Batman on screen. I think that's a pretty good chunk. Um, with Batman Returns, we only get 23 minutes, and the movie is also 126 minutes. Um, I don't know about Bruce Wayne, but I can tell you, at least with Batman Begins, we had 24 minutes of Batman in there. With The Dark Knight, we had 27 minutes of Batman. In The Dark Knight Rises, we had uh, probably over 20 minutes, give or take. Well, maybe more. Um, but besides the point, though, in reality, when you're looking at a Batman movie, of course, you know, when you have Batman on the title, who do you want to see but your, your hero? You want to see the main superhero in here. Um, with the Burton Batmans, it's always been more about Batman, not so much about Bruce Wayne. With the Nolan trilogy, as I'm talking about that, I would say you see more of Bruce Wayne. It's about the Bruce Wayne character, not so much. It's about how he became Batman and his story arc with that. So, um, trying to think of other things that I wanted to add to this. Do you have anything, other things you want to add? I got, yeah. Well, there's one Go fantastic sequence that we haven't talked about. I even I'm like sure this when I was a kid. Is when you have Penguin in the tiny little Batmobile yes. controlling Batman's Batmobile, which is another one of those great things where I'm like, that's such a great scene. That is such a great scene. I even loved that obviously when I was a kid too. Yeah, oh, I, I love it. Kid, yeah. yeah, it's like it's like you because that's exactly the same machine that you played on after the 1989 Batman in the arcade. Yeah. And Penguin has it, and it's it's exactly what we were talking about. It's creepy yet ridiculous, and yeah. like that's what Tim Burton does best. Is everything's like it's really dark and weird. But that's also so corny and so over the top. Not only just have – because if you just had Penguin go back to his trailer and he had maybe a little joystick. But the fact that he has a tiny little Batmobile inside his trailer and he's bouncing around like a big old baby because yeah. that's what he looks like. Yeah. It's, it's – it's, it's fantastic. And uh, and and I just love that scene. I, I love seeing the Batmobile just boom, 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 just crush stuff. Yeah. And I love obviously the ending when he like, you know, he's flicking the button and he can't even, he can't get that button to work. And Mike yeah. Keaton's just like, oh, that's funny. And then he like, yeah. starts freaking out. Like, yeah. You never really see Batman panic. So you right. start to see him panic. And then boom, all of a sudden the Batmobile becomes really skinny. The Bat goes Missile. The little, yes. Like, yeah, the little Bat Missile. It's ridiculous, but it's great. Yeah. It's a little over the top. But like, I love that sequence. Mm-hmm. I think that's such a good sequence. It is. Yeah. He's like, gentlemen, start your screaming. And it's, yeah. it, it's such a big change from when we saw the Batmobile in Batman 89 because it was more for show, I think. they had Maybe it had when it was going into access to chemicals, you know, it had some machine guns and it dropped the mine in there. But this time they really used the Batmobile a lot i think that actually gets more presence than bruce wayne in this movie i'm not complaining about that at all because that is my favorite batmobile i mean i love the tumbler um but the the burton batmobile is still one of my favorite it probably my favorite i think um you know and just the little quotes that danny devito's saying to batman i played this city like a harp from hell you know um i'll take care of the wretched you know twin head pinheaded um whatever of gotham see i should be quoting this a whole lot better Helpless old lady at twelve o'clock high, and then Batman, and Batman, and Batman, Batman has it. just enough time. Yes. Batman has just enough time to put that little disc in, right? Because that just shows how cool, calm, and collected Batman is most right. of the time. He's yeah. like, "Oh, I know I'm crashing into people right now. I'm crashing into cars and causing a lot of property damage." Right. But he's saying things that need to be recorded, so I'm just gonna put this little disc in the CD player. Yeah. Also, who knew? It officially confirms Batmobile has a CD player. Yeah. You know, he's listening to his pan- 
album in the first movie <laughs> in the second movie and just like putting that disc in there but yeah man like that i think that like you're saying with that Bo- batmobile i must think with the two movies that we get that batmobile in that's mm-hmm. the best sequence with it yeah that just tearing apart the streets you get to mm-hmm. see its power mm-hmm. because if you like the 1989 batman you look back at that uh really quick batmobile chase yeah. it is like the slowest thing there's nothing that to it yeah. barely fits on the it has to use a grapple gun just to take a sharp left turn. <laughs> yeah. Like it's pretty ridiculous. But yeah. I think in the in Batman Returns is a little bit more badass. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um. You have. I mean, they applied some CGI when he you know does his shields. I think just the details that they put in with that. I think it's awesome. Um. You know, like you said about the bat missile. It's you know I had that bat missile, that Batmobile that turned into the bat missile. I replayed that scene as a, with my toys as often as I. I could and now looking back i'm like what else could he really do with the bat missile besides fit into two really narrow buildings what else also, would that what serve? If it was there like it just fit perfectly what if those buildings were just a little yeah. bit closer apart you know right like, he knows the architecture of gotham that right. well yeah and he's like this is the skinniest this is the skinniest <laughs> alleyway in gotham I got right this yeah um yeah good stuff there the uh the bat boat it was nice seeing that i mean the bat missile was pretty much the bat pod before it was even um trying to think of other things him just suiting up you know when he goes into the bat cave and when after he's um you know done smooching with uh selena kyle he goes down there because he's trying to go into gotham city because the penguin's trying to set him up he has you actually see the inside of where all his bat suits are and he has all his bat suits hanging and why does he Ridiculous. pick the fourth one i have not a clue i guess it's like the third or fourth one in Another they're all exactly flourish, the same man. it's the lucky yeah. it's the lucky suit for the night you know obviously it was the unlucky one um he has all the different bat boots lined up which coincidentally were actually air jordans from what i read um you know i think oh. i think that was pretty cool um you know it's just the the details with that i mean like i said everything about i have no complaints about what they did with batman in there it's just i wish they could have used him more i really do i really you know let's talk about let's talk about the never the talked about but obviously never happened batman 3 with Ooh. tim burton and michael keaton okay right yeah um because i am I, like i there, uh, there's so many projects like this. Even, even just recently, you had like Edgar Wright with Ant Man, right? Like, yeah. what if there was an alternate reality where all these movies existed? Like, oh. I would love to see Edgar Wright's Ant Man the same way. I'd like to be like, I wonder what Tim Burton's Batman Forever would have been. Obviously, it wouldn't be called Batman Forever, right? But like, you know, I wonder what that third Batman movie would have looked like because even though, and we've talked about, like, I'm not a huge, huge fan of the second movie doesn't mean i'm not interested to see what he would have done with that what would have been his trilogy like Mm -hmm. i'm assuming that would have been his last one and maybe that would have because batman forever doesn't really connect to these other movies Mm -mm. like much you know i wonder if billy d would have come back in the third one i wonder if you know they would have had catwoman because obviously we learned that she survived at the end of this movie Mm -hmm. i wonder if she would have been back maybe they would have teamed up or something i would love to see batman and Catwoman actually like kind of team up in some some regard. Ooh. I don't know, and try to have that relationship. Maybe yeah. Vicky Vale's back. Like I would like to kind of see the connections between. In the same way that the Dark Knight Rises, when they completed that trilogy, they picked up strings from both the Batman Begins, and then even Dark Knight didn't even talk about certain things with Batman Begins. Mm-hmm. It was talked about again with you know Dark Knight Rises. I wonder if Batman Three would have been like, we're bringing back Vicky Vale. We're bringing back you know things that we didn't even do in the second one. But, you know, whatever. It's, you get Catwoman, you get Vicki Vale, you get Harvey Dent, you get all these things. So, mm-hmm. I don't know, what do you, what, what do you think we would have gotten out of a third uh, Tim Burton Batman? Well, I'm glad you mentioned this, because I found this article on uh, Den of Geek, and actually it was about Batman 2, um, before we jump into 3. Um, so, Sam Hamm, the writer, he helped write uh, Batman 89, and he was coming back to write this. It was called Batman 2, and he wrote several different treatments of the film. So, it was going to be a sequel, picked up, you know, over a year after the events it would be during christmas but like i said penguin and catwoman were in it but it was going to be more the vibe of the joker kind of that style um you know they talked about kim basinger's vicky vale was set to return and would settle down with bruce wayne after they became engaged um we'd also be introduced to a young homeless robin who could have been played by marlon waynes mm-hmm. that, 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 yeah i remember reading that yeah um Let's see. Uh, it would be more closer to the comics than any of the original Batman movies. Uh, but t- when Tim Burton returned uh, on the condition he could make the movie any way he wanted, um, some of the elements of Batman 2 were saved, but many were changed. Um, you know, I heard that, you know, we talked about Max Shrek, that, you know, actually it was intended for that character to be Harvey Two Face, which probably would have made more sense. It really would have been. It's hard 
to picture smooth Billy D. Williams, Lando Calrissian as a bad guy. It really, really is. No matter, even though he, the closest we had was an Empire Strikes Back, but I would say that him as Two Face. The only thing we ever got was like a Batman, which I know you were a fan mm-hmm. of. Yeah, yeah, and I love that they did that. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. It's like even though we get we get Billy D for like three lines of dialogue, yeah. that first line of dialogue you see him in Lego Batman, he's like, "We got to get that gate open, baby." It's just like <laughs> love it, yes. love it. I love to see that in an actual movie. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm sure he would never be as over the top as a Tommy Lee Jones Two Face. Mm-hmm. I think he would have been more along the lines of an Aaron Eckhart Two Face, but still, I don't know. It, it, it more gangster kind of type in a way, I guess. He probably would have been smoother, you know, because oh, that's it, what we it, know. Billy D. Williams so, is the definition of smooth. I, I don't know how know, much more smooth you can get. He'd be than drinking that. his Colt 45 with one hand, and then he would have something else <laughs> with the other two face side. Yeah. You know, but like he, maybe that's how they would play it. Because I, yeah. I know Tommy Lee Jones's performance was kind of criticized because it's not very, it's very, it's very much like the Joker. Like his, oh, yeah. it's funny, his Batman Forever, you have, we've talked in length about Batman, uh, Batman Forever now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but I think you get Robin, you get not Robin Williams, you get, Jim Carrey, and then you also get Tommy Lee Jones both doing different interpretations of the Joker in a way, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. I, I'd be interested to see Billy D's maybe. Yeah, he probably would have been like a gangster, but he would. I couldn't I couldn't see him just being like, oh, like we got from Tommy Lee Jones was laughing that whole movie. Yeah. I think Billy D could have been like a smoother kind of calm, cool, collected criminal until maybe you ticked him off. And then he just boom, shot you in the head. And that yeah. also goes the Burton's direction however tim burton would have done it mm-hmm. you know i don't know if he would have gone over the top well he goes over the top with everything but i could but, see yeah I, I i would like to see that character you know I, I just it's just such like i said curious parallel reality that exists somewhere right where batman exists oh i'm sure there's a lot of fan fiction that's been created since you know even up to this day for what could have been um, I, like I said, I would have liked to have seen Vicky Vale return as much as I love Michelle Pfeiffer. I just, I, because Vicky or Kim Basinger was my it girl since I was a little kid, you know, I, I was so disappointed that she didn't return in Batman Returns. They kind of said, you know, she, you know, a little bit why she wasn't there just didn't work out because she, because Michael Keaton's, uh, Bruce Wayne and Batman, she couldn't live with that, you know, just right. uh, with him being those both characters. Um, you know, I'm trying to think, of course, you know, I didn't. Even though uh, obviously Jack's um, Joker did die in Batman '89, I wasn't. I never even think about his Joker when I'm in Batman Returns at all, because I, I think the villains, per, the performances were that good. I really do. Right. Um, if Vicky Vale would have returned, I don't know, maybe. Um, but I would have liked to seen another Michelle Pfeiffer Catwoman, like you said, maybe teaming up against Two Face. Um, maybe they would have had the Riddler. Um, I know that I I'm glad they did not introduce Robin in Batman Returns because yeah, maybe you and I have talked about this or not. I'm not a fan of Robin. I'm not a fan of Robin at all. I'm really not. I like Batman fighting alongside Commissioner Gordon. I like him fighting alongside even Catwoman. Um, but I do not care for the Robin character. I like how Robin was used in Lego Batman. That's the best interpretation of Robin I've ever seen before and the only one I like to this day. Um, yeah. I also think I also think Addy, we already talked about how many characters there are taking the spotlight from Batman. Let's yeah. throw Robin in there and also oh, take more yeah. spotlight. You know, I think Batman three, like I said, I, if it was like Tim Burton's, like this is the end of my trilogy, mm-hmm. I would love to see kind of what well, kind of what we saw with the Dark Knight Rises in a way, but right. like Tim Burton's version, maybe like Batman. Batman is so kind of secluded, and maybe it's all about him have even even what we get from Lego Batman. Maybe it's him like having the team up with. Maybe Robin has to come in, and maybe you know Bat uh, Cat Catwoman has to come back, and it's like him all of a sudden coming to terms with like he can't just fight all the villains of Gotham on on his own. Right. So I don't know what that would mean. Maybe you get Two Face. Maybe you get Riddler, and you know some weird darker version of the Riddler or whatever that means. But like I would have kind of just liked to see what Tim Burton would have been like. This isn't the final one. You know we're gonna go out on top. Right. I don't know if it would have been like big bombastic blockbuster or if it would have been like an artsy film like this mm. one. Um. I mean, that's kind of the interesting thing. I wonder which way you would have gone because we kind of got both from him. We got the blockbuster, the more blockbuster, uh, you know, crowd friendly version, and we got the dark, twisted, artsy version. Right. So I wonder what the third uh, one would have been because obviously the studios after the second one were like, nobody's buying these Happy Meal toys. We no. gotta, we gotta get, we gotta get Schumacher in on here. You know, that's kind of yeah. what happened. So yeah. I don't know. I, I think it's just such an interesting, fascinating because Tim Burton was down. 
he was ready to do it. Yeah. And it was more of the studio being like, don't you want to go do more Edward Scissorhand like movies? Exactly. Come on. That's exactly what they said. That's right. Yes. Um, you know, he wanted, he had his vision of what he wanted to do. And once again, it's what the studios and what the audiences. And what's so funny about this is we live in a time where we have rotten tomatoes at critics consensus and users reviews um the internet and a lot of the internet actually like batman returns and the critics like batman returns better than batman 89 i for one like batman 89 better i I, it's because of i don't know it's got to be jack's performance in there maybe because you see more of batman it's maybe it's yeah it can be cheesy at times i could see that uh it's still my one of my favorite batman movies i don't know it's because it's my first batman movie i don't know um But going back to what we could have seen or what I would have liked to have seen in a third Burton Batman, I would have liked them to explore the themes that were briefly touched in Batman Forever about Batman trying to decide if he wants to go on and continue being that, if he can continue being both Batman and Bruce Wayne. I think that's definitely an element Burton could have explored a lot more. Um, Mm -hmm. Even with the amount of villains that he would have had in there, I would have liked to have seen – it sounds dark, but I don't mean it to be – the uh, of Alfred Pennyworth, how he was dying in Batman and Robin. I would like to see how he would, because I felt like they had such a great uh, rapport in that movie. Um, mm-hmm. the, everything from the cold soup in there to, like I said, about him saying, "Oh, who led Vicky Vale in the Batcave?" Um, uh, little, all kinds of little things like that. Why is why are you are you still up? Why are you so interested in this uh, penguin character? Um, mm-hmm. I think that Keaton could have brought more emotion to that. As and I'm not saying Clooney is not a great actor, great actor because he is in that movie. He wasn't because that's the kind of role it was written for him. Um, what else? Uh, I would say that, and I would say that the villains. You don't have to ha- more. Doesn't always mean you know doesn't make a movie better when it comes to villains. I really don't think it mm-hmm. does. One villain is enough. If you want to have two, you know that's okay. But I, you, like you said, you had three villains. You go from one to three in this that's a big extreme so yeah um let me see other things i want to talk what else did you want to talk about on here but while i'm gathering up some of my fun facts real quick let's see i think i think for batman returns i think you know probably i think tim burton michael keaton i think everyone involved in this movie i think if you were going to look at this in compared to 1989 i feel like they're just any of them would probably say this one they nailed more i think like michael keaton would be like i think i nailed batman yeah in the second movie more so than maybe the first movie right and i think tim burton would be like this is i made the film i wanted to make this is yeah. exactly why it's not like oh well the first one was fine but i wanted to do some other stuff with you know maybe that's what happened with the original one and the mm-hmm. second one he's like no this is exactly what i wanted to do for better or worse this is what it is right. and i just think i think like we were talking about i think there's a lot of stuff that is a step up from the first 1989 one i think like i think we were talking about like the look of it, the world, Gotham City itself feels there's more a little bit more character to it. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't feel as back alley ish. Maybe because we see yeah. more. We see the sewers. We see, you know, it's Christmas time. Maybe that yeah. kind of helps. Uh-huh. Kind of see their ritual. We see more. We get more of a feel of just the characters that uh, exist in Gotham City. And, you know, so I think from pretty much every department, I think they I think they nail it. I, I think I think I think, like I said, the rapport you were saying with the rapport between uh, Bruce Wayne and Alfred like there's just so many little things there. Just like I think that 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 was like good enough that they didn't even need to come back for a third one because it's like yeah. what else would they have done with it? Mm-hmm. But like, yeah, man. I mean, I, like I said, it's like I don't love the movie. I appreciate the movie, and I'm just happy. I am happy that Tim Burton just got to go full Tim Burton because anything a director ever wants is just to have their vision of yeah. a film, and the fact that he got to do it because he earned it. You know, he earned it from that first movie. He made the first movie. It was him. Like he was the biggest part of that success was, mm-hmm. you know, of of nineteen eighty nine Batman. Right. So it was kind of like here's your earning as you go with make the weirdest uh <laughs> Batman superhero movie that we've ever seen. And he's like, Cool, <laughs> I'm gonna go do that and then, you know, go make Planet of the Apes or something. You yeah. know, so uh Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, man, I, I just, it, I wish I loved this movie more than I did. Yeah. I, 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 I wish I was like a hardcore, like, oh my God, like it's so cool and weird and everything. I'm like, yeah, it's cool and weird and there's some really good stuff in it, but like, yeah. I, it's not a movie that I want to rewatch all the time. You yeah, know? me too. I think you have to watch it just... It's not so. I can turn on Batman '89. I can turn on even Batman Begins in the Dark Knight. Whatever scene it's in, I can just continue watching it. Um, rewatchability, I would say Batman Returns. Not something I can watch. Maybe it's because it is darker. I guess, um, or just 
I'm not sure. Something about it. But I, and I, I maybe yeah. I, I I won't say love when it when it comes to Batman Returns. I really enjoy it. Um, if I'm rating it on a scale out of five, I would say probably a. I would lean more towards the 4.5 because I, I like so many things about it, but the film overall, when I'm going back and thinking about it, it's like, it's still not my favorite Batman film. And it's because of Michael Keaton's Batman is not it can, like the main character of this, even though he is the highest build. How would you rate it? As five, I'd probably give it like a 3.5 out of five because okay. every, for every like great sequence and cool little either if it's a gadget or if it's the way that he gets to the bat cave or even yeah. just any of those little small little the way his suit looks and whatever it is the helicopter umbrella or whatever oh, yeah. you know all those little cool things there's bigger things for me personally i know people love the same things i don't like about it but there's just bigger things where i'm just like yeah but the penguin storyline is so like it's just for me it's the penguin storyline is the big thing where i'm yeah. just like yeah i just don't feel for it i don't care about it and it's funny because, you know, it is an episode of the 1960s Batman where Penguin runs for mayor. Yeah. So it's like a weirder, darker interpretation of that. Right. Um, and, and it's just like, I don't know. I just I just don't really care for that as much. But like I said, like we've been talking about this whole time. Everything with Batman is just perfect. Awesome. Yeah, it everything really is. with Catwoman and even us talking about like even her transformation, even though it's weird and creepy and it makes you kind of feel uncomfortable a little bit. I'm like. What? Even right now, after we're done recording, I'm like, I'm kinda, I feel like I'm going to watch that on YouTube right now. Like, I'm down yeah. to see the Catwoman stuff. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to the Penguin stuff, I'm just like, geez, I think maybe this is it. I think the Penguin is so over the top mm-hmm. that I can't connect with that character at all. Mm-hmm. Like, the fact that that Penguin, like, everyone, like, you know, he starts to become bear. Everyone hates him. And then he cowers back to the school. And he's like, I'm going to take every child from Gotham, every firstborn. And he's going to throw him in toxic acid. And I'm just like. What are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Whereas I feel like Batman and Selena Kyle, I'm like, okay, you guys are more grounded. I get you guys. Penguin right. is cranked to 11, you know, and he only mm-hmm. goes higher. You know, he only goes up to 15 throughout the movie. So right. anyway, um, 3.5 for me, which yeah. I think is still good. Like, it is yeah. still a movie that I appreciate, like I've been saying over and over. Under, I like it for its artistic capabilities mm-hmm. um and also just as an interesting fascinating piece of superhero cinema yeah right i'm just mm-hmm. like the history of superhero movies you got batman returns in there yeah but yeah i think overall i just wish it, i wish there was maybe more batman less penguin and mm-hmm. you know so on and so forth do you think it holds up uh, after 25 years uh i think there i think i think the thing about both tim burton movies is that they don't hold up as well as they did because when they did you know, especially coming off of up until that point, the only live action thing we had seen of Batman was Adam West. Rest in peace, Adam West. Yeah. Uh, all we had was corny Batman. Right. So up at that point, it was like, look how dark and gritty and realistic Batman is. And look how Gotham City is so grimy. And like, you know, it was like unbelievable. And it's funny because I think it's because of the Christopher Nolan Batman movies mm-hmm. that definitely feel at this point a lot more realistic. We look back at these and go. It's, I don't know. It's just more of like a time capsule of like, oh, this is what people thought yeah. realism and darkness was. So I don't think it holds up in certain regards to that stuff. But I think there's a lot of I think from like a, you know, I think from a uh, from like a character standpoint and for like the themes of this movie, like especially when it comes to Batman and 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 uh, and Catwoman and a lot of what they're dealing with. I think all that stuff is like perfectly good like i think a lot of the writing mm-hmm. and, and all those themes and stuff are like right on the money i think when it comes to more of like the uh yeah like the action maybe or the character dynamics and stuff like that you might mm-hmm. be like oh this is what an action movie was back then interesting right. interesting you know mm-hmm. like if kids were watching it now i don't know how connected they would be with it but i think it would still creep them out i think yeah. it's still just as creepy it still creeps me out so yeah. i think it's just just creepy for seven-year-olds now so it holds up yeah it's it, 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 50-50. Yeah, I think um, what you said, I think different generations will have a different respect for it. I think, you know, well, kids nowadays, I never know what's going through their minds, but who knows, you know, maybe like the um, Generation X, maybe they will have an appreciation for this movie because it's odd. And because now we're at a time where superhero movies don't just have to be just origin stories. This There's different um, genres of superhero films. There's the spy, there's comedy, there's 
very, very much drama. This one even falls into drama, thriller, horror, if you will. Yeah. Um, not so much action. So, um, you know, I was asking people online what they had to think about this. Um, Real Talk Inc. They said absolutely, it, um, it still holds up classic at its finest. Um, Ronnie Castle, he said better than Batman 89. Great walking, but Selena's useless. Have nothing to do in the movie. Hate the origin. What went wrong with the comic version? Okay. Um, agree to disagree. Robert Reed, too many villains. Didn't see the bat until 20 minutes plus in. We'll agree with there that. You there you go. Um, New York Tom um, on Instagram, he said, I liked it and I still do, but I love Batman 89 a little bit more. It's what got me into Batman when I was five years old. Uh, the real Gary Simpson, I really like Batman Returns and it makes a great alternative Christmas film. Agree to that. Um, Universal Exports London, my favorite Batman film. Tim Burton is my favorite Batman director. Okay. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Bold he, statement. Yeah, and this is coming from a very big James Bond fan. He, um, Robert Sterling, he is a huge James Bond fan. My Budget Bond said, first Batman film I saw in cinema, and the Bond Connection um, said that, in my opinion, the best Batman movie to date. Ooh, uh, I, you know, I know we've talked about that before. I've asked you, uh, what, what is your favorite Batman movie again? I forget. Is it Lego Batman or? my? Well, Lego Batman, I thought was great. <laughs> yeah. I, I think my favorite one even I, I was I was like I wish I had a more original take, but I think it's probably the Dark Knight. Yeah, me too. It really yeah. is. Yeah. And let me let me ask you a question. I got sure. a question for you. Absolutely. All right. Obviously, obviously, as you just said, as you just read, all the the everyone's up in arms about this movie. You know, right. we all look back twenty five years and you're just like loved it. It's so weird. It's so different. Better than nineteen eighty nine, and it might hold up better than nineteen eighty nine. Maybe. maybe. Um, but let me ask you. I think this movie is very divisive. Do you think I think at the time, especially when this came out, I think the I think most people were like, that's it. That's all we get from our Batman movie, you know, whereas now, obviously, we've had nine Batman movies or whatever. So there's so many different choosing. Do you think now because we have so many superhero movies and like you were just saying, one's a heist movie, one's a this movie, one's a thriller, one's a comedy, whatever. We have so many different types. Do you think Batman Batman Returns, the same exact movie or same type of movie came out now? it would maybe get a better reception. Like if, if Ben Affleck's Batman was just as weird as this one, do you think people would be like, oh, how dare this be our Batman? Or do you think people would like kind of come to terms with it more? Because we, it's like, well, it's one superhero movie of like 90 superhero movies that come out now. I think it would be received pretty well. I really do. And this is discussion I was having a couple weeks ago online is that a lot of people, including myself, are tired of seeing these end-of-the-world superhero movies. We're tired right. of seeing the Ghostbusters light in the sky waiting for Gozer or whomever to come and you know, destroy the world. Um, you know, Something like this, it wasn't about world domination. Sure, um, the Penguin wanted to become mayor, but that's not what his original plot was. And like you said at the very end, at most he wanted to well, – I say at most – he wanted to take the firstborn sons and throw them into toxic acid. It's like – like over the top okay but he didn't want to destroy the world i mean he was going to use he was going to blow um up gotham city i guess to a point with the missiles with the penguins um but it's just that you know like i said different types of comic book movies this actually is probably why a lot more people like this because it's not just or even movies like the dark knight or batman 89 because those movies weren't about just you know okay we have to have one super action sequence at the very end and this is going to be the action sequence to end all action sequences because it's a summer movie and that's what it calls for this it was something different it was actually very reminiscent when i saw the dark knight for the first time the first thing i thought of was batman returns you know why because it was a revolver it was a guy holding a revolver at the very end and he ended mm -hmm. up shooting batman i'm like wow i mean i'm not saying that no one stole that but i'm saying maybe that was kind of like his little callback to that in a way and i like that because it ends off with more drama it's like man he just shot batman that guy's got some balls yeah. he really does um you can't shoot batman i mean how <laughs> dare you um but he got his um so to answer that in a very long statement i would say yeah i think that you know it would be very well received i really do um i think that's something about this movie i don't know whether it's the age or the era when this was released but like i said just reading those comments online just within the last 24 hours and reading what other people say everybody's saying this could be the best batman movie that's not the first time i've heard that um i don't agree with it I, I i don't i would say if you're looking at the best batman starring movie batman begins would probably be the best batman movie if you're looking the best of the batman films then i would say the dark knight would probably be the best of the batman films 
So agree to disagree on that with everybody. Um, everybody's entitled to their opinion. You know, that's what's so great about movies. There's a different flavor for everybody. And as long as you're a fan of Batman, then you can still be on this show and still follow mm-hmm. me. <laughs> um you know uh i'm trying to think of other things i want to talk about with batman returns i mean like i said it's uh definitely acquired taste you know i I think we could say that um lots of pros but still not my favorite batman movie but still something i enjoy going back to so um you know other quick things i want to touch on are you good with time yeah i'm ready to hang out um Really quick, we're going to zoom past news. Um, Danny Elfman, you know, I just mentioned this name about him doing the Burton Batman scores. Well, guess what? He's coming back to score the uh, Batman movie, but in this case, the Justice League. What did you think about the Danny Elfman score from the Burton Batmans? Uh, iconic. It's yeah. definitely iconic. That's the one I think a lot of people remember, even more so than, you know, the Christopher Nolan ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even, you know, even Danny Elfman helped with the animated series too. So it's yeah. like, you know, that, especially for the time, that was like the best, that was maybe the greatest superhero score. I mean, obviously you have Superman, which is John Williams, like oh. that's memorable too, yeah. but, but like it, it was, it's iconic. You can still hum it. I, I probably can remember that one better than the Dark Knight one. So mm-hmm. I think, I, I mean, obviously it's like one of the best scores ever. So what, what else am I supposed to say? It's pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. I got to say that when I heard this news, of course, I, the immediate thing I thought about, I'm like, oh, well, you have a guy that was doing the scores and Danny Elfman's done some really great scores. The first Mission Impossible score is one of the best scores to the Mission Impossible movies. Um, you know, he did the Spider-Man, he did Spider-Man one and two, um, with Sam Raimi. So he, that's another superhero genre he did. Um, he did the Avengers Age of Ultron. He ended up helping out with that also. Um, and what's, you know, kind of a coincidence or ironic with that is that, you know, now you have Joss Whedon who's coming in to help direct the Justice League to pick up because of what happened, um, with Zack Snyder's daughter. Um, you know, and now you have like somebody you had originally Chunky XL scoring that, but now pushing him aside. And now you have Danny Elfman scoring. I'm like, I'm nervous because, you know, I'm, I'm so familiar with that Burton Batman theme. I'm like, what could he do with a Justice League score? Or is he just going to bar the music from Hans Zimmer and Junky XL and that new iconic Wonder Woman theme that I love? I really love. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope they keep those themes in there and he just creates like a bit, a, a united kind of, you see what I did there, <laughs> unite the seven. Um, if, if he does kind of a Justice League theme, you know, if that's what he's, he's coming in to do, then I'm, I'm down with that. But at the same time, I know a lot of people are excited about this. I'm more nervous, to be honest with you. Um, so we will stay tuned and see what happens with that the movie comes out in November. So actually it's not far away. If you really look at the clock, um, Matt Reeves, it was explaining his take on Batman. He was speaking to comicbook.com. He's right now. He just finished up wrapping up with war for the planet of the apes, which is getting ready to be released in the next, I would say a couple weeks, give or take, or in, within the next month. Anyway, um, he wanted, he was explaining how he wants to take more of a personal take on Batman, which I really am excited about. Um, he says, quoted, look, I'm just starting Batman because literally uh, War for the Planet of the Apes, as I just said, we finished about a week or so ago, and now we're publicizing it. So we haven't even begun on Batman. For me, what's important is to try and find a personal way in. In that, I do feel like I relate to actors. It's about understanding emotionally the way something is. I see the parallel between Caesar and Batman, really, which is the idea of these characters who are grappling with their own struggle and trying to do the right thing in an imperfect world, and so I really do relate to that kind kind of idea i hope that he can bring that to screen i really do i mean i liked what was it dawn is it dawn to the planet of the apes the second one i think yeah dawn is yeah i I liked it i I gotta go back and watch those movies um so i'm excited about that um so stay tuned for that um don't know if ben affleck's coming back as of what i know um the the producer for the dcu film said that he is coming back but who knows? Let's see what happens with Justice League. I have a theory out there, and I announced it last week, so I'll sh- enlighten you on that. That I don't think, I think Batman's going to die in the Justice League movie. Just, oh, just, really? Just, I, I had this weird hunch. I really do. I don't know why, but it, especially, so you think, you especially think that's now that be they're doing reshoots, reshoots, especially yeah, now they're doing think? research. Yeah, sorry, to interrupt. Yeah, um, it makes me think, man, that would be really ballsy if they kill Batman because I'm the one in the back of the Dark Knight Rises, spoiler alert for Dark Knight Rises, cheering. I'm like, no one's going for it. He's going to kill Batman. That is, that's, you know, go for it. Why not? Because we have never seen that in a Batman movie before. If they do that with Justice League, you know, imagine if now you have Superman coming back 
and Wonder Woman, and then you have a different Batman. Dude, for, let me just say that I actually haven't even thought about that. Oh man, that's Batman. my fan theory. That that that's that's, that's me getting nerdy. Here's the thing. All right, we already spoilers. We don't have Superman right now. Yeah. You're already you're having a Justice League with no Superman. And what you're proposing is, let's say at the end, let's say we get to the third act of this movie, Superman's back from the dead. The yeah. Justice League are together. Oh, now Batman's dead. Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> like we just want to see Batman, and Superman being hang, hanging out with each other. Yeah. I think that may obviously you have all these problems with Ben Affleck, or you know, like per, he's dealing with personal stuff. We all have personal stuff. Like that makes sense. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think. Ooh, yeah, the damn reshoots, man. I don't know. That's a that is a ballsy fucking move. That's yeah. a that's a hell of a theory. Uh, I don't I don't think they're gonna kill him. Not in this movie. I think they might in the in V yeah. Batman, mm-hmm. and it might be a passing of the torch to whoever they cast as yeah. Robin or whoever you know is gonna mm-hmm. be the next Batman or something like that. Younger, because luckily the thing is they've already cast an older Batman. We already right. have this older, withered, experienced Batman. So I actually think that could be a cool idea for like the Batman, which could be this kind of, you know, maybe it, it's about his whole life. It's about something from his past is now come back. Maybe it's like the Red Hood or something. We don't know mm. what storyline it's going to be, but yeah. maybe the Joker comes in, but it's him dealing with things from the, like 20 years ago, come back. And so now it's him in his age and that's a whole factor. Yeah. I don't know, but I kind of hope that doesn't happen just as like, <laughs> I just want to yeah. have a good time. I oh want yeah, I do come too. Back. Yeah. Together and just kick some ass right. and great and then deal with all that crap on the back end yeah i mean as for the reshoots reshoots happen you of all people know with movies they happen all the time and it ends up usually making a movie better but some of the time also what could have been um i just think that everything that ben affleck's been going through everything you know from him not being the director anymore of batman everything the shake-up that's happened with the dcu um, you know, everybody, I liked his Batman. I did like his Batman and Batman v Superman. I, the little cameo we had in Suicide Squad enjoyed also. He looks the part. He acts the part of Batman. He might be one of the better Batman we have. I still rank Keaton and then Bale and then him. Um, we won't talk about Clint or Kilmer tonight. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I would say that, yeah, it would be in a, it would be really interesting approach if they decide to do that because they always have Flashpoint and then you could have a different Batman. That's a, that's another thing. Yeah, I had. yeah. Um. Really, really quick here. Let's go into birthdays and anniversaries. Obviously, an anniversary we just had was uh Batman Returns. I'll hold off on the other ones for a minute. Barbara Broccoli, the producer of Eon Productions, she runs it over there with her brother, her stepbrother, Michael G. Wilson. Celebrates a birthday on or celebrated birthday on June 18th. Um. Been producing the Batman. I'm sorry, James Bond movie. Excuse me. Since Golden Eye, uh, one of my favorites, and um, I think that you. You know, she's the daughter of Albert R. Broccoli, and she's definitely been, you know, she holds down the fort. I think she's done a great job with the direction overall of what James Bond movies have done with, you know, breathing new life into them anyway. Um, Paul McCartney celebrated a birthday on June 18th. Also, the performer to the title song of Live and Let Die. Um, Yeah, The Beatles meets James Bond. That is really an interesting movie if you have not seen that. it's uh, (laughs) It really is. Uh, Luis Jordan celebrated a birthday on June 19th today. He played Kamal Khan in Octopussy. Um, it's all in the wrist. I'll leave it at that. Uh, Virginia (laughs) Hay. Did you see that movie, Octopussy? No, but I, I'm putting together a lot of dots just based on that quote. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, you got to see that. And you got to, you, if you've seen any of the Sir Roger Moore movies, you have to just envision that and a good um, backgammon scene. It's really good. Um, <laughs> okay. It's probably one of the best scenes of the whole movie, actually. Uh, Virginia Hay, she played um, Ru- Ru- Rubovich, I'm trying to remember, in The Living Daylights. Um, and she celebrated a birthday on June 19th. I'm trying to remember who that was. <sighs> I'm drawing a blank here, but anyway, happy birthday. And Nicole Kidman, I know that is a favorite of a lot of the listeners out there, celebrates a birthday on June 20th. Can you believe she's, how old is she? Like 50, I think, maybe older. Maybe she just, I think she just turned, yeah, she looks great. I just watched a movie or TV series with her, um, Big Little Lies. She is amazing in it. She really is. If they would have written a better role for her in Batman Forever, you know, really. Mm, Such a shame. Dr. Chase Meridian, man. Can't forget that name. Yeah. Chase Meridian, man. You can't. Ah, that movie. Oh, that movie. That. Yeah. We'll talk about that anymore. We will talk about that. <laughs> Another time, perhaps. Um, Batman Begins celebrated a 12-year anniversary over the weekend. Uh, what more can you say about Batman Begins? Um, we will 
eventually be having an anniversary of that, you know, full review on that show. Uh, no idea when that is will be. Um, you know, I would say that um, Batman Begins is still one of my favorites. Uh, Batman Forever celebrating anniversary on June sixteenth was released in nineteen ninety five because of you. Okay, I'm 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 pointing a finger at you there, sir. Because of you, I would say that is my least favorite Batman movie. If you can believe it. I told you. I know. Any haters out there listening, (laughs) you watch that movie. You tell me if that's better than Batman and Robin. Like, just pure fun. You're having a great time watching Batman and Robin. Crack open some beers. Batman Forever is just boring. I watch Batman and Robin. Truthfully, I watch Batman and Robin on Friday. And it happened to be on TV. I didn't turn it on intentionally, but I was like, you know what? I know who I'm having on the show, and I'd love to talk to him about it. Because there was a news story that broke over the weekend about the director, Joel Schumacher. And this is the apology we've all been waiting for. Joel Schumacher officially apologizes for Batman and Robin. Are you ready for this one? Um, He said, look, I apologize. I want to apologize to every fan that was disappointed because I think I owe them that. Um, you know, he admitted he got caught up with Warner Brothers over the sequel, despite knowing another film was not needed. He says, you know, I just needed I, I just knew not to do a sequel. If you get lucky, walk away. But everybody at Warner Brothers was expecting me to do one. Um, he also went on to say, I guess I'll say I hope no fans moved on from or I hope um, no fans moved on from Batman upon first seeing my movie when i first approached was approached to do batman forever um i said that it was tim burton's franchise at the time danny devito's character with the penguin was causing a ruckus among parents also michelle pfeiffer with her fabulous bondage outfit didn't help matters people across america were objecting to everything tim who is a great friend of mine begged me to take the franchise because of the pressure and he was ready to walk away what's interesting to me is if you see tim in my version you can see how innocent viewers were back then it's really interesting thing at me is because you see Tim's in my films you don't understand how innocent the audiences were um sorry then when you see Christopher Nolan's trilogy the last one especially when he's dealing with the real class and economic problems you see how the audience has changed in the fact that they can accept it and want darker and darker subject matter so it shows you how times have changed it really does um the, the Joel Schumacher movie Batman Robin is a great comedy if we're talking about a comedy superhero movie it really is um you know I watched Batman 1966 for the first time probably within the last three months, and that's a comedy movie. It's, it's, you know, it's, it is what it is. I'm not going to mock it, but Batman and Robin didn't intentionally go out to be a comedy movie. It's just what we got. So if you can look past that, enjoy the puns that are in there, enjoy the poison I- ivy that we have that's, well, she is, she does look pretty good in that, I will admit. Um, and the Batgirl of Alicia Silverstone coming right off Clueless. Well, that's what you got. Oh, so. man. But um yeah, um and I did not like the Batmobile. That'd probably be the only thing I really didn't like in that. It movie. doesn't. Yeah, the Batmobile man doesn't even have a roof. No, what why are you why doing Batman? That? No, he's going topless with that. I don't get that at all. Um, moving on. Going topless with the bat nips. You know what I'm saying? Ah, I see what you did there. Ah, nice one. All right. all right. Um, really quick, I will go into the Wonder Woman 2017 tournament. We are just finishing the Elite Eight. Um, you know, announcing the winners tonight. Honey Rider ended up uh, losing to Eve Money Penny from Skyfall Spectre. Naomi Harris played Eve Money Penny, 55 percent to 45 percent. The number one bat, uh, Bond girl ended up. You know, being booted from the uh, contest. So I'm sorry, guys. Wonder Woman ended up really beating Harley Quinn 80% to 20%. I thought there were more Harley Quinn fans out there, but when you hashtag Wonder Woman right now, um, yeah, I think that's what's going to happen. You're going to get like a big support for Wonder Woman. Uh, Vesperlin ended up beating Batgirl, and that's the Batgirl from Batman and Robin. I had to make sure I put that on there. Alicia Silverstone's Batgirl. I think everybody got the point with that. Vesperlin won at 54%. Um, hashtag save Vesper. There's some uh, fans online that have created that hashtag. We'll see if she makes it to the very end. I think it's going to be really uh, close when I mention these um, the next contest here. Um, Selena Kyle's Michelle Pfeiffer won um, 91% to 9% Sylvia Trench from Dr. No and from Russia with Love. Um, yeah, you can't argue with bondage in a cat suit. You really can't. <laughs> you really can't. <laughs> um, so the final four begins this week. It will be Eve Money Penny versus Wonder Woman. I, I will predict Wonder Woman um, going on to the finals. 
And it's going to be, this is going to be really tough. Vesper Lynn, because there are a lot of Ava Green fans out there of Casino Royale and in general. Ava Green is one of the most beautiful women on the planet right now, I think. Um, and Selena Kyle's Michelle Pfeiffer. Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer's uh, Catwoman, Selena Kyle. That's, uh, oof. A lot of fans out there, so that's going to be up to the fans. Make sure that you vote. When you vote at Batman versus Bond on Twitter, um, you know, every vote counts. I can't vote. Bobby, you can vote, but I can't vote. And, you know, if you yeah. don't vote, then, you know, don't cry and pout about it. So, um, yeah, I guess that wraps it up for this episode of the Batman versus James Bond show. Bobby, it was great having you on the show again. Um, where can people find you, sir? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Captain Boberto, and more importantly, you can find my show or the, my podcast, That's So 90s Podcast, on Twitter at That's So 90s Pod, and on iTunes, and on SoundCloud, and all that stuff where you can find uh, your podcasts. Awesome. It's a great show, guys. If you are a fan of the 90s, Power Rangers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you just recently did a Flubber episode, which yeah. means I have to go back and watch Flubber because I've never watched it before, to be honest with you. So I had to pause that Ain't episode. Ain't missing much. Okay. <laughs> maybe, well, maybe, maybe not. But it's Robin Williams, so I'll give it the benefit of the doubt. Um, yeah. Please subscribe on Spreaker and iTunes. Rate my show five stars and leave a nice review for both shows on there. We would very much appreciate it. The biggest mm. thing I ask is that you share our shows, yeah, yeah, share our shows with your friends, family, anyone that's a fan of Batman and Bond, the 90s. Follow me on all the various social media networks, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Batman vs. Bond. Find the show at BatmanVsBond.com and on the BS Podcast Network, BSPodcastNetwork.com. Uh, yeah, Bobby, once again, thank you for coming on the show. Great time, man. Hope to have you again on yeah, here sometime. Man. Love talking Batman. Love talking Bond. Anytime you need a guest, <laughs> I'm down. All right, I'm always just sitting here with a microphone in front of my face. I'm not I can doing see that. stuff half the time. So, you know, just Get on the old Skype. Call up Bobberto, all right? Bobberto, you got it. Like James Bond, I will return. Until next time, I'm Brian Thomas. Thanks for listening, everybody, and have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye. podcast is part of the bs podcast network visit bspodcastnetwork.com for more shows just like this one and perhaps a few that are just a little bit better